All right, now we're live. Okay, so uh, apologize for those technical difficulties. Uh, we are back with our first look at our beginning to pray um, studying, uh, our, our CNXC study uh, on the book Beginning to Pray by Metropon Anthony Bloom. Uh, we have just spoken about his introduction, how he was a monastic that reluctantly found his way to the church. Uh, and then found out that his Christian faith was more than just a, a book club or a Bible study. It was an actual interaction uh, with a living God. Uh, and that interactions with living people are two-way streets. They're not just something that you can enjoy just by speaking kind of a, a, a monologue and have someone just hear you whenever you want them to. There's free will that comes into play uh, and God has free will as well. So we always have to be respective of uh, his timeline for things. Okay, so let's continue on. We talked about that uh, whenever we come in and approach our Lord in prayer, that it is a moment where we are approaching our potential judgment. And we have to be okay with that. And in fact, if we live our life understanding that, then chances are we will be better Christians for it. And so that's where you get into the remembrance of death, which was step six from our 30 steps to heaven uh, on the, the ladder of divine ascent. Okay, so beginning to pray, he's going to get, we're going to talk about this now. Beginning to pray is also kind of bringing along with it this beginning to be obedient. So if we're, we could not in any way uh, dare to consider ourselves people of prayer or, or any kind of experts in prayer uh, if we're not obedient servants. Uh, and so the two go hand in hand. We can't pray without following God's will. So we have to listen to him. We have to perceive what the will of God is. And that takes that given, that, that, that requires that give and take uh, in our relationship and our dialogue with him. Okay. Let's continue. So we want something for him. We want something from him and not him at all many times when we pray. Uh, and he's saying that oftentimes when we pray, if we're just, if it's like a normal Tuesday, sometimes we'll wake up or when we say our prayers at night, we'll kind of go through the motions and we'll feel uh, like we're doing something good, but maybe maybe it just it, it seems like any other any other moment of the day as opposed to standing face to face with our creator what he is saying here is that in those moments when you're praying for something that you really care about or when you're praying for someone who you love and hold dear if in those moments you feel more fervor in your prayer if you feel more of a desire or an uh, or a, a, a longing for this prayer to be answered then chances are we're not praying right and that's a really alarming feeling because I think all of us have felt that way. You know, you, you say the Lord's Prayer how many thousands of times, you know, in a given year, maybe even maybe even more than a thousand times in a given year. Uh, and I mean, are all 1000 of those times, you know, full of fire and, and passion when you're when you're praying those words? Uh, or do you feel different when you're praying for a loved one who's going through some terrible medical condition or, uh, you know, the coronavirus, the concerns if someone's been afflicted with that. Why do we feel different when we pray? Why, why is praying for our daily bread somehow more mundane than praying for our kid to do well on this, you know, big test or this big, you know, exam or, or whatever it is? If that's the case, then the chances are we are praying to receive something that we want something from him and not necessarily want him uh and so the hope is that when we really learn how to pray you know purely we will always feel this yearning during prayer and not just when it's about something that we really want or something that we feel strongly about because we will always feel strongly that we are in the presence of the lord so that's the key we always want to feel strongly during prayer because we want to feel like we're standing before the throne of God. Okay, so let's think of our prayers. Uh, so let's think about our prayers. The moment we try to be what we are not, there is nothing left to say or have. We become fictitious personalities and unreal presence, and an unreal presence cannot be approached by God. 
So we need to always make sure that we are living genuine lives uh, and not uh, kind of being hypocrites or, you know, maybe even being in denial ourselves. Um, but so he, he threw that in as a, as a little, uh, as a little parenthesis to say this, we must at least be concerned with his will, even if we are not capable of fulfilling it. But if we are not, if we treat God like the rich young man who could not follow Christ because he was too rich, then how can we meet him? So that's where we're saying, if we want to pray, we have to be willing to listen to him. So if we want to be able to talk to God, we have to first be able to hear him and what he wants for us in our lives. Okay, so when we appropriately view God in ourselves, then we can begin to prioritize him and to follow his will. This is a prerequisite for prayer. You need this. It's one of the essential things before you can even start to, to, to pray at all. Uh, and then when we get to that point, when we follow his will so, you know, in tunely, when our lives are so in concert with, with his will for us, uh, then we become like a man who has taken a bride and no longer is surrounded by men and women, but just by people. Uh, and Diane just chatted. Would it be hard? This is from Diane. Would it be hard for someone with personality disorders to reach God if they are not being true to themselves? That's a great question, Diane. Um, that's that's where you start to get into some uh, really uh, specific and like nuanced things. Um, so we understand that our our relation our life in Christ is a relationship and it's not one that we necessarily have to understand and that's why we baptize infants that's why we baptize you know people with mental disabilities or disorders uh because you don't need to be operating at 100 percent mental capacity to be able to have a genuine and, and authentic and transformative relationship with christ uh and thank god for that uh so so would it be would it be difficult for them because they are no I, I wouldn't say so because i would say that their mental disorders are something that are genuine to that person so even though like if someone is bipolar and they feel one way one day and feel another way the next day that's genuinely who they are uh so it's not that they're projecting this outward sense of piety and and religiosity but inside they're just you know looking for vices and passions just like the the faithless you know so i would say i would say that that's a little bit of a different that's a great question um but that's a little bit of a different scenario um so i, I would say that they're being real to themselves and being authentic to themselves in as in as much as they are able to but great question on that um so when we when we can pursue a life with him uh, that's meaningful enough, uh, then, and when we, when we are so focused on, per, on performing his will, uh, then it's like that man that's just overcome and just completely infatuated with his spouse or, or, you know, with a, a woman with her husband, the idea of like, to you, everything else is dead. Everything else is just kind of like background noise. I, I don't see that woman over there as a woman. I just see that woman. I just see that person. You know, I, I see someone who is, Someone that I should love, but not someone that I care to spend any attention on right now uh, in that way, because I'm so committed in my own relationship uh, that I that I've cultivated, uh, and so that is a lot like mourning uh, in step seven. On again, if you go, if you're looking back, if you're reading this in conjunction with uh, the thirty steps to heaven, uh, and so this I, this constant remembrance of our sins and that our Lord desired to take us as his bride, even though we were, you know, terrible people that, that don't deserve his love. He, he wants to give it to us nonetheless. And when we have that morning, it's like this bright sadness uh, or in this constant state of gratitude and appreciation uh, and not some kind of like, you know, uh, depression. Okay. All right. So what we have, he goes on here to say, um, that there are many dark sides of our lives uh, and we need to eradicate them and live a life that's congruent and that's completely united uh, in our faith. Uh, so God is prepared, he writes this, 
God is prepared to be on the outside of our lives. He is prepared to take it it up completely as a cross, all of our burdens. He is prepared to take our burdens as a cross. He is not prepared to just be simply part of our life. I think that's a really profound statement. He is ready for us to be completely apart from him and for him to, to do all of this, you know, carry all this burden for us. But he does not want to be compartmentalized in our life. He doesn't want us, he doesn't want to be, he's not satisfied with being like a hobby that we like. You know, or just something that we like to do as a pastime. He wants either our entire life or he wants to continue to die for us so that he can save us and bring us to him. Uh, so he's prepared to be on the outside of our life uh, and he's prepared to be within our hearts, but he is not prepared to be, you know, confined to a room in our hearts. Um, so when we think of the absence of God, is it not worthwhile to ask ourselves whom is to blame? right? Are we to blame for it? Probably. So this absence of God is not really his absence. It is our inability to perceive him or our inability to uh, run to him or our, our lack of desire to seek him out or our lack of desire to change ourselves. So not just part of our life, but our whole life. Uh, and then this, this idea of mourning, this, you know, this, uh, this, appreciation, this gratitude for him loving us despite our sinfulness is continued here at the bottom of that same page where he says, if we wish to pray, is the certainty that we are sinners in need of salvation, right? If we wish to pray, the certainty that, that we are sinners in need of salvation is something that we need to have, that we are cut off from God and that we cannot live without him and that all we can offer God is our desperate longing to be made such that God will receive us, receive us in repentance, receive us with mercy and with love. Um, so again, it's that idea of we don't deserve a communion with him, but he gives it to us nonetheless because he is that loving. He is that good to us. Uh, which is a really, really beautiful thing to think of and a beautiful thing to realize. And when you realize that, gosh, how could you not want to run to be to that person? The person who loves you despite all of your flaws? I, that's who I'd want to spend all my time with. You know, not someone who I have to kind of keep up, you know, appearances with or, you know, have to get dressed up for. The, the person who loves me who I am, uh, that's, that's the person I want to spend my time with. And so once we start to see that and start to instill that perspective in our lives, then prayer becomes a little bit easier. Okay. All right. Again, all of this, I mean, look at the title of the book, beginning to pray. All of these things that we're talking about are to, are the things that help us start to pray. Okay. And he talks about the next thing right here. All we can do is turn to him with all reverence, with all veneration, with worshipful adoration, and the fear of God, and ask him to do something with us that will make us capable of meeting him face to face, not for judgment, not for condemnation, but for eternal life. This all we do, we take all of this on, we try and perform all of these things, this obedience, this like uh, this disposition to, to be receptive to him, so that we can start to pray, not so that we can grow in prayer, but so that we can even start to be receptive to the idea of praying. Uh, so it's the prayerful state uh, that we need to kind of focus on. Okay, now we have to remind ourselves of the parable of the publican and the Pharisee, because when we're talking about prayer, that is really one of the purest icons of what prayer looks like. We want to be the publican and not the Pharisee, the one who just knew his standing, who knew that he was not worthy to be in the church. So he stood in the very, very back and didn't lift his eyes up to heaven and just asked for mercy. Okay, so the person who had humility and knew his standing, but nevertheless came to present his prayer because he was confident in the expectation of God's of God's hope and God's, God's uh, forgiveness. So now what we've learned from the Pharisee, and he writes this here, and I think it's a really beautiful thing. Uh, what we learn from the Pharisee is that this world is a world of competition. And in that world of competition, in this world of predatory animals, in this world of cruelty and heartlessness, only the only hope one can have is an act of mercy. Uh, and notice that world of competition and of heartlessness and, and of like predation. 
the Pharisee was acting as a predator. The Pharisee believed that he could be saved, that he could be redeemed because he was better than the publican. He believed that God would accept him because he was a more suitable servant than that man over there. That is not the correct way to think of that. The correct way to think of how we should be with God is the way the publican thought, where he said, the only way that I can be redeemed is not if I'm better than that person, but if God makes me better than who I am. That's the important thing. So we have to keep the standard on the, the standard as Christ and understand our standing as beneath that. Okay? I thought that was a really important thing. So for us to understand uh, how, if, if, if we want to grow in prayer, we have to understand how to pray. And our, with the way we pray is always with our eyes on the Lord and not to somebody else, uh, not as a competition with somebody else, uh, but one that is inward focused uh, on our sins uh, and, and only looking to, to God for, for mercy and love and knowing confident, being confident that he will give it to us. Okay. So uh, the way that the way that the the publican approaches God is the way we should always approach God in prayer, okay? Knowing that I don't I don't deserve to be here, I don't deserve to talk to you, but you want me to talk to you, nevertheless, because you love me so much, and I I know that your love will prevail. Okay, so now Saint Paul writes in Second Corinthians twelve verse nine, uh, "My power is manifest in weakness," and that's a really great statement. Uh, and it shows here the power of humility, that when I, when I confess my weaknesses, I am strengthened by the Lord. Weakness is not the kind of weakness which we show by sinning and forgetting God, but the kind of weakness which means being completely supple, completely transparent, completely abandoned in the hands of God. We usually try to be strong, and we prevent God from manifesting his power within us. When we try to rely on our own strength, that means that we're shutting ourselves off to God's strength. So whose strength do we want to rely on, right? Who do we want? It's funny, we were, we were watching uh, this Michael Jordan documentary that's been on the last two weeks, which is incredible TV. Uh, and if any of you are Tar Heel fans, you should absolutely watch it. Uh, but Michael Jordan in, oh gosh, I think it was episode three. One, one, of, the, one of the episodes from last night, uh, from Sunday night, was talking about how Phil Jackson when they won their first championship, the thing that got them over the hump was that he started to trust his teammates and that Phil Jackson drew up a play and said, I need you to pass to the open guy. Who's the open guy? And Michael Jordan said, oh, it's John Paxton. No one's guarding him in the corner. And he made what eight threes or something that game to beat, to beat the Lakers. Uh, so in that moment, we have to understand who do we want to take the last shot when the game's on the line? Do we, do we want to keep the ball ourselves or do we want to pass it to Michael Jordan? Do we want him taking the last shot? And in our prayer life, who do we want taking the last shot? Do we want us? Do we think that we can make you know, the, the, the difference when the, the game is on the line? Or do we want God taking the reins and you know, leading us to the lasting victory? Uh, so again, who are we relying on? Whose strength are we relying on? And in prayer, it should be very clear that we're not relying on anything of our own. And the Pharisee was doing that. The Pharisee was relying on his own standing to try and please God. We cannot do that. We have to empty ourselves and just leave it up to God and leave it up to Christ to take us the rest of the way. All right. So now this is a beautiful image that demonstrates that point. You remember how you were taught to write when you were small? Your mother put a pencil in your hand and took your hand in her hand and began to move it. Since you did not know at all what she meant to do, you left your hand completely free in her hand. This is what I mean by the power of God being manifest in weakness. Like a kid that's learning to write and then just lets their hand go loose in their parent's hand while the parent shows them how to draw or how to, how to write. That's the way we have to be when we pray. You know, not my will, your will be done. You know, when St. Paul says, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. That's the way we have to be. That's the way we, we have to be that, that empty vessel so that we are the temple of the, living, of the living God. Okay? All right. So we've got two more pages left. And, uh, and then we will be 
hopefully ready to start talking a little bit more about prayer uh, and, and starting to like actually apply some things. Uh, so one of the things that God tries to teach us is to replace imaginary and minute amount of disturbing strength of the disturbing strength that we have by the frailty of surrender, the abandonment in the hands of God, right? We need to learn to rely on him and not ourselves anymore. Okay. All right. Now, this all means that we have to be humble and we have to embrace a little bit more humility in our lives. Humility, he writes, Metropolitan Bloom writes, comes from the Latin word hummus. Not the thing that you eat with carrots and celery, but hummus, which means fertile ground or hummus, I guess. You know, I'm not sure. I didn't take Latin when I was in school. Humility is not this kind of like sheepish, you know, self-deprecating humor or, you know, like false modesty. Humility in its truest sense is like being the earth. It is the situation of the earth. And let me read this to you because this is beautiful. The earth is always there, always taken for granted, never remembered, always trodden on by everyone. Somewhere we cast and pour out all of our refuse on it, all we don't need. It's there, silent and accepting everything in a miraculous way, making out of all the refuse new richness in spite of corruption, transforming corruption itself into a power of life and a new possibility of creativeness. Open to the sunshine, open to the rain, ready to receive any seed we sow and capable of bringing 30-fold, 60-fold, 100-fold out of every seed. That's, that's humility. And when you look at humility like that, there's power in that. This, this ability to be receptive to anything and then to transform it out of you know, the, the, the fertile nature of our soul, out of the, the fruit-bearing uh, qualities that we possess, that's incredible. That's, that's incredibly heroic if you want to talk about it in, in that kind of terms. So being humble, being the same condition of the earth is the thing that is Never upset when someone trods on you because that's what the earth is there for, for us to stand on and live on and run on and jump on. Enduring all things, but being receptive to all things and taking even the worst things that people dump out and fill in landfills and then sprouting new life from it. That's incredible. All right, so humility is something we need to have if we are going to pray fervently and honestly and with a with a pure heart. Uh this is the weakness in which God can manifest his power, and this is the situation in which the absence of God can become the presence of God. Uh, only in the realm of mercy can we meet God. Christ really said, I am the door, but before you knock on the door, you have to remember that you are on the outside. If you're on the inside of the door, who needs to knock? You don't need to knock if you're already inside the kingdom. So we have to remember that when we knock and wait for Christ to respond, that our position is that we're on the outside looking in. So we have to be humble because we have to seek his reception. We have to seek reception into his kingdom. We have to be invited in. Um, we must realize that we are not yet in the kingdom and that we are still outsiders to the kingdom of God. And then we ask ourselves, where is this door and how does someone knock on it? That's the question that we're going to start to look at next week in the next chapter. So this whole chapter was to was, was Metropolitan Anthony Bloom's starting point of his life. He began his spiritual journey feeling the absence of God, feeling that there was hypocrisy in the church and that he didn't believe what the preacher was saying from the pulpit and he wanted to find out for himself. And the second he opened himself up to the presence of God, he felt the presence of God. And then he understood that this is something that he needed to have in his life at all times. Uh, and so that he saw that it's not just when I when I feel like I need something from God. It's it's that I need God. And that's, that's what I feel most importantly about. Because I understand my standing as being a humble servant that is not worthy of God's love, but he gives it to me nonetheless. Uh, and that is the, the predisposition uh, of what the publican had and what I need to have when I want to pray. 
because I understand that I need to rely on his strength and not my own. That's where you get the 2 Corinthians 12, 9 quote of that I am, I am strengthened in my weakness. So having said all that, we understand that the absence of God is not really a thing. It's just a thing that we perceive because we have shut ourselves off to him. Uh, and when we understand that, we understand that there's a great strength to be had when we actually enter into the presence of the Lord, even though it means that we are going to be entering into uh, a potential opportunity to be judged. It's also an opportunity to, to be redeemed and saved, uh, like to the publican, like all of those who came to Christ uh, with humility uh, through his time preaching and, and working in Galilee and Nazareth and Judea. All right. So. With that being said, does anyone have any questions? Uh, we ended up finishing right on time, despite the technical difficulties. Uh, and I'm, I've been recording this second half of our, of our class to, uh, or not our class, of our session to post on YouTube for people to, who missed it or didn't get the, the email to uh, maybe enjoy uh, you know, at a later time. Um, but if we're all good with that, then we'll close with a prayer. Okay. Christ is risen from the dead by death, trampling down death. And to those in the tombs, he is granting life. Lord, our God, we thank you for all that you've done. We thank you for always being present in our lives. We thank you for allowing us to know your presence, even when we can't see it or perceive it uh, with our senses. Please allow us to remember that we are always uh, undeserving of your love, but that you freely give it to us nonetheless. Please allow us the confidence to come to you in all things and to yearn and to strive for a deeper connection with you. Please allow us and guide us uh, to become warriors of faith and to become uh, true soldiers of prayer uh, and allow us a greater capacity to dialogue with you and to understand your will in our lives uh, so that we may always be connected with you mystically uh, and genuinely in every day uh, that we have here in this beautiful creation that you've given us. This we ask and pray through the intercessions of all the saints uh, and in the, the glory of the risen Lord. Amen. God bless, guys. Sorry for the technical difficulties. Thank you for being with us, and we'll try it again next week with hopefully better success. God bless. And that's interesting.